Hello and welcome to the second talk of our online series, Behind the Scenes, Analysing Anglo-Saxon Rendlesham. I'm Alice DeLeo, the Project Delivery Officer for the Suffolk County Council Archaeological Service, and today we'll be hearing from Tom Williamson on Rendlesham in the landscape. We're excited to be hosting this online series in partnership with two projects. Rendlesham Revealed, led by Suffolk County Council Archaeological Service, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, and Lordship and Landscape, led by Christopher Skull and funded by the Leverhulme Trust. You can watch the video of Chris's introduction to the, to the first series on our website at heritage.suffolk.gov.uk forward slash Rendlesham. So now I'll introduce you to Tom Williamson. Tom is a historian and archaeologist and is a professor in landscape history at University of East Anglia. We're really pleased to have Tom as part of the team for both Rendlesham Revealed and the Lordship and Landscape projects. Right, Tom, you are now live, over to you. Right, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Excellent. And I hope you can, you can see a kind of mini me down on the bottom of the screen somewhere, and you can see the backdrop of, of rural uh, rural, di distressed rural chic, I think is the term we use for this kind of backdrop. Um, right now, straight on, we've heard from Alice about uh, the way this is kind of two projects, uh, Lordship and Landscape, funded by the Leverhulme Trust, which is currently being written up, and Rendlesham Revealed, which is currently ongoing, but I suppose slightly delayed on being delivered in a weird form, of which this is one. Um, Chris Skull will have explained about the nature of the site, and I won't uh, repeat all that. Um, Bede writing in the 1720s flags up Rendlesham as being important. It's the place where Swithelm, king of the East Saxons, was baptised at the East Anglian Vicus Regius, royal palace or estate centre. And because of this reference, uh, it's, uh, Rendlesham's always been on the historical radar, and that uh, presence on the radar was increased by the interest in Sutton Hoo, which lies only a short way to the south, through the um, middle part of the 20th century. But there's been very little evidence of any importance uh, to Rendlesham, any archaeological uh, evidence showing it that importance. Uh, there was field walking uh, in the 1980s, which revealed some Anglo-Saxon pottery around the church. But it's really only over the last uh, couple of decades, really, decade and a bit, um, that the site's importance became apparent. And that was because uh, the landowner, Sir Michael Bunbury, uh, sought archaeological assistance in response to illegal metal detecting on his arable land. And Suffolk County Council Archaeological Service um, uh, began to be interested. And these four gentlemen, Alan, Rob, Roy and Terry, between 2009 and 2014, uh, and a little bit since then, have systematically metal detected the site. And when I say the site, we're talking about a, a huge area and indeed a huge amount of stuff, huge amount of metalwork recovered. This is some of the Anglo-Saxon material, but of course it isn't just Anglo-Saxon material. What you're looking at here, if you can see the slide, the pink areas are the areas which were metal detected and the red blobs are all the stuff. Thousands and thousands of, of pieces of metalwork, uh, Roman, medieval, post-medieval, Iron Age, unknown, uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, but predominantly Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon finds from uh, between the 5th and the 8th century, covering a huge area, 50 hectares or more. Um, and that site, clearly the site to which Bede refers, goes into rapid decline uh, in the 8th century and uh, by the end of the 8th century, well by the middle of the 8th century really, is no more than a standard rural site. But before then, it is clearly something special. And on this uh, on this plot, I just want to draw your attention to the fact there's two big concentrations of material. Simplifying a little here, uh, which is to the between uh, the church 
which you can see at the bottom, the church of St. Gregory, and the present Norton Hall is one of them. Then there's a, a bit of a gap with a valley and then another one, which is immediately to the south of um, another substantial farm uh, called High House. Now, that initial archaeological work, as Chris will have explained, was, was, was followed by others, by, by, by geophysics, for example. Here we have some of the plots of the, geo, the, the features recovered by geophysics. Air photography revealed what we all uh, hope uh, is the site of the Royal Hall, circled there, and some limited excavation. But I don't want to repeat all that because Chris would have told you all that, and that would then be a bit boring. Just to emphasise the though the the importance that the wealth of this site and its contacts, its international contacts, are what make it stand out. Now, I am as as uh, you've heard from Alice, I'm a landscape historian, and this talk could have been subtitled "What Can Landscape History Contribute to the Study of Anglo-Saxon Rendlesham?" But that question really comes after another, which is what is landscape history? And many of you will know what landscape history is, but for those who don't, I will try to define it. It started really as a subset of history itself under W.G. Hoskins, who wrote the amazing book, still an amazing book, in 1956, The Making of the English Landscape. Hoskins was a historian, social economic historian, but the subject then kind of changed through the 70s and 80s, particularly under the influence of people like Christopher Taylor. It became much more archaeological in character. And subsequently, with the interventions of the great Oliver Rackham, uh, a layer of, of, hist of uh, historical ecology was put on the subject. So now, if I have to define it, I always say, apart from the fact it's more fun than anything else, well, the most other things. Um, it's a combination of social and economic history, field archaeology, historical ecology, uh, and historical geography. That's how I would put it. It's about how the physical environment, the world around us, came to look the way that it does, and what the features and structures in the landscape and their spatial arrangement can tell us about that history. It's kind of above ground archaeology. It includes archaeological techniques like field walking, the uh, walking up and down the ploughed surface of fields looking for pottery and other artefacts and earthwork surveys, so it includes all that, but it embraces the study of trees and hedges and woods and settlement patterns and standing buildings. And in particular, it relies on, uh, relies on old maps. So in terms of Rendlesham, looking here, we have, we're very fortunate to have uh, a number of, uh, a good number of early maps of Rendlesham Parish. This is a survey from the 1730s, probably by John Kirby. And you can see the church and Rendlesham Green, which has now gone, and Norton Hall uh, to the at the other end of it. Uh, we use documents. Uh, this is a manorial extent from the 14th century. We look at trees, which seems like a weird form of archaeology, I suppose, but a tree is a piece of standing archaeology. This is one in Rendlesham, uh, a medieval feature almost certainly, and of course at standing buildings. So that's the kind of thing I'm interested in. Earthwork surveys too, and field walking. This is uh, showing some of the stuff that um, was discovered uh, by, by Tom Loder uh, back in the 80s, but we will be hopefully doing more field walking as part of the project. Now, one way of thinking about landscape history is using these sources, these medieval and post-medieval sources, to reach back in time to try and meet the archaeology that's being recovered. And sometimes that reaching back doesn't take, doesn't have to go very far. So you will notice, I haven't got a, a pointer here, but I, whether you can see that, there's a, there's a, a, a deep recut ditch there, which um, showing up on the geophysics, which is um, Randleshan Green, which I mentioned before, and it shows on, on old maps. So sometimes the reaching back isn't much of a, a span or a gap to meet the archaeology. But sometimes it's a bit more, and I've spent a lot of time recently trying to sort out the manorial history of, of Rendlesham Parish, uh, the medieval and post-medieval manorial history, simply because um, it would be good to know where the main 
doomsday manners were, because when we get back to doomsday, we are within three centuries of the end of that site of the Rendlesham site, or it's it, within three centuries of the end of its its peak. And I won't bore you with this because it's horrendously, horrendously complicated. Um, but there are two main holdings, essentially, among lots of smaller um, properties at the time of Doomsday in 1086. One is held by Gilbert of Colville, remember that name, and the other one is held by Godiva and passes to Hervey Bourge. Uh, and uh, the in the medieval period, those two become the manor of Colville and a manor referred to usually as Norton Hall alias Rendlesham. So those are the two main manors. It would be good to know where they are and relate those to the archaeology. Uh, where are they? Well, the, the, there are about seven main medieval manors, and those seven medieval manors, as far as we can tell, develop into rather posh ring fence farms in the medieval period. They absorb their tenancies and become single big holdings. Uh, and we can plot using a range of documents the property attached to each. Uh, the, the real complication, the mind bending complication, concerns Norton Hall. Norton Hall today is this place, and I've pointed it out on a number of the, the, the maps and plots, um, so it's, it's there. But if you go back um, a little earlier, it's not there, it's there uh, on the site of Rendlesham Hall, which is now demolished, but was a mansion, large mansion, owned by the Thelyson family from the late 18th century. And the top slide, so you can see on the right, is Norton Hall as was then, and on the left, top left, Norton Hall as it is now, was then one of these big tenanted farms. So that, that's not the traditional side of Norton Hall. Just to make matters even more complicated, um, Norton Hall, uh, also known as the White House, uh, is then uh, rebuilt on a number of occasions, first by in the 1790s, then in 1830, then in 1870, each time, um, slightly um, slightly shifting its its position. You don't need to worry about all that particularly. It's it's a sort of uh, fascinating, obscure thing that you get stuck into in landscape history, but really isn't very relevant to the project. What is relevant to the project is it does seem that originally uh, Norton Hall, alias Rendlesham, wasn't on the White House site at all but actually on the site of High House, which is one of the two places I showed you when I showed you the plots of the metalwork. And you can see it's actually called Rendlesham Hall, that place on Hodgkinson's county map of uh, 1786. Uh, if you look south of Rendlesham Hall, you'll see Berevets, Colonel Colville. Now, Berevets or Bavance is a minor manor, in the medieval period. Colonel Colville, well, that's a bit of a coincidence, isn't it? The manor, the second great manor is called Colville's, and here's someone called Colonel Colville. Well, actually, this transcription of the map is wrong. The colonel is Colatus, meaning joined with, because Bavant's manor is joined with the manor of Colville's, and in fact, Norton Hall, as we have it today, is Colville's manor. Now, if you're confused by that, uh, you should be, uh, because uh, I still am, but what it means is basically this. High House was the original site of the Godiva Bourge holding in Doomsday, one big manor. Um, uh, Norton Hall, as it is today, is the site of the other. That is interesting because it means of the two great concentrations of Anglo-Saxon material, one is indeed close to Norton Hall and one is just to the south of High House. So we have both of the main manorial sites within our area. Uh, of, and and it, it's kind of mildly interesting in that although in one sense there's discontinuity in this landscape in the 8th century, it ceases to be this great uh, royal site and becomes a, a, a kind of normal rural settlement. There is continuity in the sense that the two main concentrations of, of, of stuff do become the sites of the main medieval manors. Um, <clears throat> not directly, not on site. If we look here at the, the latest Saxon metalwork, 
we can see uh, in fact, well you can't because the high house isn't clearly marked, you might just see it there. Uh, it's not quite on the same site as the scatter of middle and later Saxon material, but it, it, it's close. So there's a degree of continuity. And enough of this. This is this is in incredibly complicated and, and and only peripheral. This is more basic. And this is to do with the idea that to understand the landscape and the environment of Rendlesham, Rendlesham when it was um, uh, in its period of importance, we can reach back through the post medieval and medieval documents and maps to get some idea of patterns of land use. What you're looking at here is the Rendlesham Parish boundary and the red cross marking the church uh, and then the soils and the light blue strip is the floodplain soils, uh, those are water meadows, the vertical shading, the Newport two soils, those are sandy, loamy, pretty fertile, pretty good soils. Higher ground, Burlingham three, those are the heavy clays or heavy-ish clays and then Newport four um, are the acid sands. So the higher ground has less attractive soils. Um, and we know in the medieval period that most of the arable land in open fields lies on those good soils of the Newport two, whereas maps show that fields with names relating to woodland or its clearance or uh, woodland itself tends to be located on the heavier upland soils. And indeed, if we add the, the land use known from the, the Tive map, we can see that there's quite a lot of pass drop on those soils. Now we can use these post medieval sources as a base on which we then plot the distribution of the uh, Middle Saxon metalwork, early and, early and Middle Saxon metalwork. And we can see that uh, that is concentrated away from these wooded and pasture areas. But you'll notice also that although it's mainly on those Newport two soils, those distributions do extend up onto the clay. Now, some of those distributions are from burial, some are from direct from occupation, but some relate to uh, uh, material being dropped during work in fields, etc. So it's, it's showing areas which are being used and which are open and those clearly extend onto the clays. Now, this is where it's kind of more interesting, and that is working with um, Stuart Brooks, who I think is going to be talking to you later um, in this series. Uh, he can do clever things with uh, with computer mapping. And one of the things you can do is you look at the clay soils. Uh, well, this plot here is again showing the early Middle Saxon metalwork. Uh, the green are these Newport two loamy soils. The clay is the, the buff colored stuff, except where it's red, and that is where it is sloping. And what you can see here is that they are using the sloping clay where the water can drain off relatively easily. What they can't really cope with is the more level stuff. So it's the subtleties in the landscape, the subtleties in the natural environment are what are particularly interesting. And sorry, let me go back one. And the other thing that's important here is, is just this general contrast. I'm going to come back to this quite a lot now between that the sides of the valleys and the uplands. The sides of the valleys are where the good soils are, at least good in terms of uh, Anglo-Saxon technologies. The higher ground and the more level ground is clays or sands which are more difficult to, to use. Now, let me just widen out a bit because this, what we're looking at now is the immediate surroundings of Rendlesham. These kind of approaches, looking at topography and looking at the environment, are very important also when we try and look at the wider territory. When we try and look at the territory from which uh, the site may have extracted resources and over which it may have ex exercised authority. Now, there are various ways of looking at uh, the environment and the archaeology. Usually, Rendlesham is thought of as part of the Sandlings. It's uh, along with Carlton Cole, Blytheborough, Snape, all these well-known Anglo-Saxon sites, Sutton Hoo itself and others like Icon, where Botolf established his monastery in 654 or whenever. Uh, these all are associated with these sandy strip of sandy soils down the coast. And these sandy soils, according to the way most people conceptualize the environment, are the ones most easy to cultivate. 
therefore they're the, the sort of heartlands of Anglo-Saxon settlement. The interior, those greeny soils, those are the heavy clays, those can't really be dealt with. Now to a point this is fine, but we need to be more subtle. And the point to make here is that the sandy soils are not all the same thing. Some, like those Newport two soils we were looking at earlier, are very attractive to early farmers. But most of the higher ground is very acidic. Uh, much of it is now forestry commission plantation. Uh, in, the, in the medieval period, post medieval period, it was open heathland. So that is also marginal. Now, some of this open heathland was wooded. Some is still is wooded. This is Staverton Park. It looks like something out of Tolkien. Uh, the best bit of medieval wood pasture surviving in East Anglia. Uh, which lies on Newport 4, these acidic sandy soils on a higher ground. This is how John Norden shows it, and you can see there's a very sharp boundary between the wooded land of the deer park and the open heath around. But that boundary, the park pale, doesn't correspond to any change in soil type. The soils are the same within the park and outside the park. It's, it's patterns of land use, patterns of control, which have retained the trees in one and lost them in the other. And indeed, if you look at the field name uh, next to the park, it is actually on this map of 1601 called Woodland. And more widely, uh, looking now, I'll come back to this map in a minute, but looking at um, the red blob is Rendlesham. The green squares are Doomsday, Doomsday Place names referring to Woodland. Those were analysed uh, by Ellie Rye, who works on the project, great place name expert. Uh, and you can see some of those are actually associated with the area towards the coast within the sandy soils. So Rendlesham sits surrounded by woodland, if you like, on, on all sides. Incidentally, I should say nothing is kind of new. Um, things are always being reinvented, really. In 1946, Arnott, talking of East Suffolk and, and the heaths, actually said, looking at the place names, it would seem that East Suffolk may once have been a district of forest land rather than open heath. So the contrast isn't simply between light soils and heavy, there are contrasts within both those categories. And that brings us to something which uh, is going to be a little dull because I'm going to read this, the, the following slides, uh, and uh, hope you read them too. We use models, ways of thinking when we approach data, and one that's very prominent in landscape history was developed by people at Leicester University quite a long time ago by Alan Everett and later by Fithian Adams. And we call this for shorthand river and wold, just a way of thinking about stuff. And this assumes there is a contrast between the soils found on lower valley sides, well drained, at least moderately fertile, and suitable for use as arable land, and those of the intervening uplands formed in poorly draining clays or in acid sandy drift. Most of the significant settlements in late prehistoric Roman and early Saxon times were located in major valleys where there was also a good supply of water. The higher valley sides and the interflues, the bits between the valleys, were occupied by tracts of woodland and pasture. They, they were thus spatially as well as agriculturally marginal. That's the critical point. Now that's that's really just repeating what I've already said. This is the more interesting one. Because the upland wolds, the upland woods between the valleys were only sparsely settled, they tended to constitute cutoff points in patterns of human interaction to form, that is, the margins of social territories. Communities like Rendlesham were focused on particular valleys or valley systems. And over time, social territories tended to approximate to drainage basins. Now, let me just see how that develops. Um, we can pick this up in a number of ways. One interesting thing is that, that um, early territories, early Anglo-Saxon, middle Anglo-Saxon territories may to some extent be preserved in late Saxon patterns of administrative organization. And in particular, in the boundaries of the units called hundreds, subdivisions of the Shire. This is Norfolk. Uh, what you're looking at is in red are, uh, are 100 boundaries. Uh, the shading is uh, river catchments. In the north, it's rivers draining into the Wensum. In the south, it's ones draining into the Thet and the Little Ouse. 
And you can see how the 100 boundary really closely follows the watershed between the two, the point where the, the, the division of which way the water would flow. In Suffolk, there's a very famous example um, developed by, uh, by, by Peter Warner, the Blything Hundred with Blythe broke its centre. Blything means the people of the river Blythe. It sounds like some old folk ter territory. The boundary of the hundred does follow the high ground of the watershed of, of, of the Blythe. And Blythe itself is, uh, is an important uh, site. The Liber Eliensis records that the East Anglian King Anna was buried at Blythe, Blythe having been killed in battle uh, with uh, Penda of Mercia in 654. So it's kind of river territory, and that's uh, the way of thinking of these things. And with these concepts in mind, I just want to look briefly at Rendlesham itself. Now, what you're looking at here is Rendlesham's the red blob. The dark greys are the heavy clays, the difficult clays on the uplands. The light greys are the difficult clay, difficult sandy soils of the uplands. So different kinds of marginal soil. The white is stuff which is better. Uh, and then I've used a whole range of I put a whole load of things on, all of which indicate the former presence of woodland or grazing or the tattered remains of those upland wolds. Early deer parks taken from the work of Rosemary Hoppert. Um, uh, Post medieval common land shown on early maps or heathland in the 19th century, ancient woods and place names. And you can see that looked at like that, Rendlesham isn't part of the Sandlings province. Rendlesham is part is, is the Deben Valley. And it's surrounded by these outer wooded uplands, which to a large extent separated from the sea as well. Now, once you've got a, a model like that, you then use it to, to think with, to play with one might always say. What, how, what, how do other things fit in to that kind of geographical topographic pattern? Well, <clears throat> we could start with uh, the big prestigious, big high status Anglo-Saxon burial sites of the area. Sutton, who has always really been associated by historians and archaeologists with Rendlesham, but Snape also um, might be Snape, um, uh, excavator by uh, by Pestle and Fletcher back in the uh, early part of this century. Let's just look how what they look like. Where are they? Well, they are in the wooded up uh, wooded peripheries, wooded upland peripheries of Rendlesham. That's quite interesting. That might mean something. What about monastic sites? Icon or um, Burrow uh, Hill in Butley or um, Burr by uh, Woodbridge, which uh, Rick Hoggart has suggested uh, might well be Nob Burr, an important uh, site mentioned by Bede. What do they look like? Well, they're also in those wooded peripheries, almost like you don't want your monks too close. You, you, those relationships are quite interesting. So these are just ways of thinking about the border topography. What else is on towards the margins? Well, the boundaries of the Wicklow Hundreds. Now, the Wicklow Hundred uh, is uh, a, a group of hundreds interdigitated in, in complicated ways. They look like they're one thing that have been pulled apart. And in a sense, they were one thing because they were granted, their jurisdiction over them was granted in 970 to, uh, to the Abbey of Ely by, by King Edgar. Now, several people have suggested they may well be an older, much older unit. And indeed, if we look again at their boundary, it's easy to see how that could well represent picking its way through those wooded uplands to the north, the original territory uh, administered by Rendlesham, the original kind of Deben-based Deben territory. Not necessarily, you know, exactly on that line, but ghosting it, a memory of it continuing. Um, well, you read another way, what is in towards the centre rather than the periphery? What's towards the centre of this territory? Well, the Romano-British small town of Hatchiston is only a few kilometres away. Between it and Rendlesham are two really interesting place names, Campsie Ash and Wickham Market. They're interesting because they're a kind of place name first identified by uh, Margaret Gelling, which actually incorporate, very rarely, actually incorporate unusually uh, Latin words. Campsie Ash has campus, field, 
uh, Wickham Market as Wickus in the sense of small town, presumably the small town of Hatchison. But that neat cluster is interesting. Very high status early middle Anglo-Saxon site, Romanovich is a small town and two place names showing some degree of continuity. Now, I hope that makes sense. I hope you can see how we can use uh, medieval and post medieval sources to reach back to try to reconstruct patterns in the more remote past and how if we apply these these models, these ways of thinking, they can stimulate new avenues of thought. I think that's the way I would put it. But the the project so far hasn't just been around Rendlesham, as Chris will, I think, have told you. It's also about comparing Rendlesham with similar sites, similar places where you've got concentrations of very high status, early and middle Saxon metalwork. And, and these also are interesting uh, if we look at their topographic and, and landscape context. So Burnham is one, Cases Edmund, Hoxon, Rendlesham, Codnam, Barham. I put Blythe there in brackets because unfortunately I mean, Blythe is a similar kind of place, I think. It's just that we can't really get at it because, because Blythe village is on top of it. But as well as the historical evidence I mentioned before, there are chance finds which clearly show it's a it's a major a, a, a major site of some kind from this period. So what are the how do these sites look if we examine their landscape context? Well, if we plot all the areas of common land and ancient woodland, and if we uh, if if we uh, look at the distribution of early medieval deer parks and all those other signs of the tattered remains of the upland wolds. And if we look at the place names, do we get similar patterns? Well, I can't go through all of them. I'll go through one just quickly. This is Caister uh, in, in Norfolk, Caister by Norwich. Um, on the uh, left towards the river is where the main concentration of Middle Saxon high status metalwork has been found. But there's lots of, of, of other early Anglo-Saxon material, the big cremation cemeteries at uh, Marshall and at Caister itself, uh, excavated by Myers long, long, long time ago. It's a kind of hub of immediate post-Roman activity. Uh, this is a rough plot of the density of woodland at the time of Doomsday. Um, we experiment with different ways of plotting this stuff, but basically the darker the blob, the more wooded it was. And you can see there's lots of gaps, lots of lacunae in this distribution towards Rendlesham in the south. Obviously, that's a pretty open landscape. Um, I hope you can see that in green. That's a noticeable little clear area which corresponds beautifully with this. What you're looking at here, uh, three hundreds, Penstead, Humble Yard, Depwade. The red blob is Caister. The line of the Roman road is shown. Same soil map as before, key as before. The light is very, very difficult, uplandy kind of uh, uh, sandy soils, and the dark is, is heavy, difficult clay soils. And the same pattern, if we plot that uh, material on it, we can see uh, early deer parks and commons and the rest uh, concentrated towards the periphery. So again, it's a kind of arguably, it's a, one of these river based territories, uh, which is perhaps preserved, at least in part, in the layout of hundreds, groups of hundreds, I should say, uh, with woodland and grazing on the higher ground. And again, once you get that pattern, you can then start thinking about it and playing with it in various ways. And I will just give you one. There are the 300s, Humble Yard, Henstead, Depwade. You can see how they look like one unit, the way that you've got T junctions um, at the uh, of, of, of the boundaries between Depwade, Humble Yard, etc. Um, if you put the rivers on, you can see right at the top, uh, the, the boundary follows the, the air and the Wensum, except at one point where the Wensum bends away. That's quite interesting. What is there? Well, it's Norwich. What is Norwich? Well, it's the North Wick, the Wick, not in this sense, Wickers, not like uh, Wicker Market, but Wick in the sense of a, an entrepot, a, a port, a place of exchange. It's north of what? What is Norwich north of? Well, one way of thinking, looking at it in its landscape context, is it's just north of Caister. It's on the fringes of the Caister territory. So that would be an example. Uh, and we could go through others. 
uh, but we haven't got time, but we're doing the same kind of thing. And the same patterns emerge of these various sites lying usually close to the centres or slightly off centre, down river of the centre of territories, which are river valley based, river system based, with higher ground occupied by woodland and grazing, which separate them from the next river based territory. And it does look like in some cases, at least, the broad outlines of those territories, the boundaries are preserved in clusters of hundreds or and occasionally in very big hundreds. So if we look here, we can see at the top, we've got the one we just looked at, Caster in Henstead, Humble Yard and Deathway. To the south is Hoxham, then there's uh, Barham and the rest, uh, and then there's Rendlesham in the middle of Wicklaw and Blything 100, Blytheborough, it is just one big hundred, but we can see how those river based territories are to some extent being preserved, arguably in patterns of later administration. I won't take you through these, but I'll just show you the following plot. Um, look at the, the light green one, Deersersham, Hoxham and Hartismere hundreds with Hoxham at the centre. And it's quite interesting how it's at the Hoxham is at the junction almost of those 400s, really central. But this is a plot. It looks different because this is one that's been properly drawn up by, by Stuart. And I really just wanted to show you this to make one point, and that is of all the indicators of the sort of boundaries of the upland wolds, early deer parks really do stand out. Early deer parks were created in, uh, in the immediate post-conquest period, so really quite late, by uh, the privatisation, a kind of land grab of the remaining pieces of, of wooded waste. Uh, and this is based on uh, Rob Lydiard's work to the north of the Waveney and Rosemary Hoppet's work to the south. But I wanted to show this really uh, for a quite different reason, and that is to make an advertisement. Rosemary Hoppet has just published her fantastic research on deer parks of Suffolk. It's just appeared and I absolutely thoroughly recommend it. And uh, a lot of the mapping has uh, been based on, on, on her work, as I say. OK, I want to just say one last thing, really, uh, when we think about these topographic and landscape contexts, and that is um, the way we can pick out other patterns which are, are intriguing uh, and which we can't kind of quite explain, but which we will, I think, explore. We're looking here at Rendlesham in the Whitlaw hundreds, which, as I explained before, is a sort of topographically shaped unit uh, based on, on, on the Deben Valley. And I said before that uh, the Roman town of, of, of Hatcheston lies very close to it, a few kilometres away, uh, and that we've got those place names incorporating Latin loanwords in between. Now, if we go north over the watershed into the Blything Hundred, where we have uh, Blytheborough at the centre of that hundred. As Peter Warner pointed out a long time ago, that also is next to uh, a Roman town, Wed Aston, and has a Latin name incorporating, uh, a name incorporating a Latin loan word uh, in between the two, uh, Bullcamp. Now we can't match that pattern exactly everywhere else, but it is quite extraordinary how uh, how often these centres or apparent centres of, of wealth and power in the early and middle Saxon period are close to places of importance in the Roman period. Uh, most obviously, of course, in the one we looked at a few moments ago, Caister at the top there in Henstead, Humble Yard and Deathway 800 uh, is right next to the uh, Roman town of Caister. If we go to number four, Coddenham, the Middle Saxon site there, early Saxon, Middle Saxon site there, is very, very close to the Roman town of Coddenham. Rendlesham we've dealt with, Bible we've dealt with. Hoxon is, is interesting. Hoxon, I remember one afternoon looking at the map and thinking, well, Hoxon doesn't fit. It's nothing Roman near Hoxon. But of course, I was thinking of Hoxon as just being in Suffolk. But if we think of, uh, of, of this before 
arguably before the, the, the counties become defined, but of course it's near a Roman place. It's a sort of short walk, half an hour's walk from the Roman town at Skull in Norfolk, which is shown there. So we do have this recurrent pattern. What this recurrent pattern means is a more difficult question. Because on the one hand, you might argue that this is evidence for some sort of continuity of, of control and authority and administrative organization from the Roman period through to the Anglo-Saxon. That would be one interpretation. But on the other hand, as I've emphasized throughout the importance of the environment in structuring, not just patterns of land use and settlement, but also patterns of social interaction and therefore territorial organization. You might argue that there's no, no necessary continuity. It's the same topographic environmental patterns structuring aspects of human society uh, time and time again. That would be another way of looking at it. And that's an important question and, and, and one we need to think hard about. Now, the next stage of this project uh, concentrates more just on Landlesham, uh, but also uh, the, the immediate parishes around, the whole of the Deben Valley, some more of a Deben focused exercise. And my role in that will be continuing this kind of historical research, uh, and it will be getting involved in some field walking and uh, perhaps some earthwork survey and other things. Uh, landscape survey generally and for that we will be inviting uh, your asking for your help. Um, so when the world is sane again, if the world is ever sane again, field walking, earthworks, earthwork survey and landscape history will, uh, will be uh, organised and we hope very much that some of you listening will, 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 will take part and, and, and help us and make your own contribution. I think that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much indeed. I'll leave you the final side, Reynolds and Reveal, and then I think back to Alice. Hi Tom, thank you. That was a fantastic talk, really very interesting. And just to um, echo what Tom said, yes, we will be doing some field work and involving volunteers as part of this Rendlesham Reveal project next year. Um, if you are interested in that, you can sign up to our e-newsletter on our website where we'll be making announcements. If you go to heritage.suffolk.gov.uk um, and then you'll find the, the link on the homepage to sign up to the e-newsletter.